Good evening to everyone. Um, so as everybody is very well aware, the coronavirus is uh, causing havoc throughout the world. And there's really very few people, probably no one who isn't affected at some level by this uh, pandemic. And um, from, a, from a personal perspective, this pandemic has been, or this disease has been uh, affecting my family from very early on, from my son who uh, was a ski instructor in Japan and uh, tourism went down there and he lost his job and, and had to leave, to my daughter who was traveling after her army service um, uh, in South America and they started closing the borders and she had to rapidly find herself um, with our help, a flight back at a, a very high cost um, uh, so that she didn't get stuck there. To my brother who's uh, starting a business and he doesn't know what's gonna happen to that. To a cousin of my partner, uh, Draw, who is um, uh, um, being um, artificially, uh, um, respirated in, in France, um, but is in uh, stable uh, condition because of, because of the, uh, being infected by the coronavirus. So um, my name is uh, Debbie Lindell. I'm a professor of microbiology at the Technion Israel Institute of uh, Technology in the Faculty of Biology. I'm a microbiologist that studies the interaction between uh, viruses and bacteria in the oceans. I'm not a human uh, virologist. I don't work on the coronavirus per se. I'm also not an epidemiologist. And what my aim is with this lecture is to uh, provide some of the science behind what's going on with the coronavirus, both with the virus itself and with the pandemic. Okay, so let's start. So what I'm going to do uh, today is talk about, uh, give a, an, an overview, an introduction to uh, what's going on in the world. Then I'm gonna to talk to you about who the um, human coronaviruses are, because the one that we're experiencing now isn't, isn't the first one or the only one. Then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what is known about the source of this particular virus and then give a short overview of the in infection process uh, in the family of coronaviruses, less so specifically from this coronavirus because we don't yet know too much about it. Then I'm gonna go into a bit of the epidemiology of how the disease COVID-19 uh, is um, going through the population and provide our current understanding and the limitations of, of that an understanding. And I'll discuss some of, the pro some of the prospects for solutions, what's being done currently and what will be, is being done in the future and uh, how that might help us um, deal with um, this particular virus. Okay, so um, this is considered an emerging disease. And it's considered an emerging disease because it's come into the human population from another source. Uh, viruses and bacteria don't come from nowhere. They don't all of a sudden uh, develop from, from, from nowhere. They evolve um, from other sources. And this particular virus has come from an animal source and jumped into uh, uh, the human population, and we consider the human population a naive population from the perspective of um, that our bodies do not, our, pot, our, our personal bodies and our population as a general group have not met this particular virus before and therefore we don't have any immunity to it. Um, and that's, that causes a massive problem and allows it to really spread without being held at bay by anybody who's resistant to it per se. The virus itself is called sars covirus 2 because it's the second uh, SARS virus that causes similar 
symptoms, and those are the severe acute respiratory syndrome, and that's the, those are the, that's the abbreviation of SARS. And the World Health Organization has called this disease COVID-19. So if we have a look at the global distribution of, um, of this disease, and this, this, these data are actually from about, most of the data here are from a few days ago. I've updated the numbers from, uh, to, from yesterday. Um, but what we can see here in this graph is the, distribu the global distribution of the disease. And what's very striking about it is that there are very few countries, those here in gray, that are not affected by the disease, that do not have currently any reported cases of it. All the other countries in the world have cases of this coronavirus. And some regions have massive numbers of people infected. And in fact, the US, as of yesterday, have the most number of infected people. It's a very large area and a number of different regions that, are, that have been hit, but they are now leading in the number of people that are sick and it is increasing exponentially. We'll look at that in a moment. Okay, and Australia and Israel have uh, around the same number of, of people sick and the same number of people who have died at this point in time. Okay, if we have a look at the number of active cases with time, which is here on the x-axis, starting here on 31st of December and going up to a few days ago, the 24th of March, and have a look at what's happened. We look at China where, where it began back in December, and we see that China, uh, the number of cases, active cases increased in China uh, to a very high level, which was a very high level then, in, in, in February, and then um, they managed to get it under control and for the uh, um, number of cases to decline to levels that they are now controlling it uh, and have actually released people from the lockdown they had there. Uh, and and uh, so that they're a very good example of how it's possible to keep this uh, pandemic in the, under control. Since then, and from China, it's spread throughout the world. Uh, this happened, it, it, it um, um, began before the Chinese New Year and spread um, uh, to all the people, because of all the people that were traveling from Wuhan to other parts of China and other parts of the world, it spread, it spread dramatically. And we can see here an exponential increase in the number of instances uh, throughout the world. We now take these data and, and break it down uh, to Europe. Uh, we see that massive numbers of, of, of cases in Europe, mainly Italy, Spain, France, UK, and the United States, uh, increasing to very, very worrying numbers. Uh, in, in Asia in general, we have a stable number of, uh, of active cases over time. We have a look at the numbers as of yesterday, uh, Israel time, um, not in Australia, but Israel time. We have over 600,000 cases. And I have to say that last time I gave this talk was on the 24th, 24th or 25th of, um, of March, just a couple of days ago. And I had to change this number from 415,000 cases to 600,000 cases. It's increasing massively. The number of death, deaths so far, uh, is over 27,000 people. Number of people are recovered, about 130,000. But what that means is that we have another 440,000 cases that are still active and will, in the end, go into one of these two boxes, either recovered, which will probably be most of them, but a fair number of them will end in death. And that's very, very worrying. Okay, so a bit of a timeline. Um, of the disease uh, with a bit of a Israel uh, emphasis here. But um, first case uh, of this disease was, ho um, was hospitalized in China on the 12th of December. By the 31st of December, China was aware that they had an outbreak on their hands and they reported it to the World Health Organization. The first death in China happened on the 11th of January. 
By the 24th of January, it had spread to Europe, and the first case was, um, was discovered in, in, in France. On the 30th of January, the World Health Organization declared this a public health emergency of international concern. The first case in Israel uh, was on the 21st of February. By the 1st of March, it had been clear that it had been transferred from somebody who'd come from overseas to somebody he worked with within Israel. By the 11th of March, the World Health Organization had declared this a pandemic. Now, I can't emphasize enough that the World Health Organization doesn't do this lightly. Giving, declaring something a pandemic is a very serious thing. It has lots of implications social, uh, socially, uh, um, lots of indications. It's not, it's not declared lightly. Um, at that time, Israel started increasing the um, limitations it had on, on gatherings because it, it was clear by then already that Israel had not managed to contain it. In other words, to prevent people who were coming in from the country to spread it. It was spreading within the country. So then the next phase is something called mitigation, whereby you try and take the people who are sick and isolate that and reduce the extent of the um, spread within the country. And there's similar types of things that ha have been happening in all countries. The first death in Israel was, um, uh, happened on the 20th of March. As of, as, of, um, to, as of yesterday, the cumulative number of people uh, sick in Israel is about 3,000 people. The number of deaths is 12 people. We compare that to Australia, it's actually very similar. Australia has um, over 3,000, I think it might be around 3,300, 3,513 deaths as of yesterday. In fact, Israel and Australia seem to be moving fairly similarly in, in, in uh, numbers. Okay, if we now, um, if, if you look at data from um, sequencing of the genomes of these viruses, uh, then the estimate is that this moved from animals into the human population uh, late November, early December, which actually matches what we know about, the, uh, about what happens on the clinical side. If somebody was hospitalized on the 12th of December, chances are they first became sick, sick anything from seven to 14 days prior to, to that happening. Okay, so I'm gonna start with um, describing what a virus is because I think it's re very relevant to understand what's going on um, and for the things that I wanna um, explain to you. So a virus is basically um, a piece of um, genome, um, which, or, or you know, genetic material um, that encodes all of the proteins needed for the virus to replicate itself. But the virus doesn't necessarily have, in fact, the virus doesn't have everything that's needed to replicate itself. It requires many things from the cell or the person, the organism that it infects, so the cells that it infects in that organism, and it takes over that cell. In fact, it even, you could even say it hijacks that cell to make that cell replicate the virus. And it turns the, the cell into a virus, fa a factory for production of new viruses. Beyond the genome, which, which is responsible for making sure that happens from the virus's perspective, the virus has a protein coat that surrounds surrounds the genetic material. If this is the genetic material, the nucleic acid, then there's a protein coat that surrounds it and protects that uh, genetic material when the virus is outside of the cell or outside of the host in the environment. Now the virus that we're talking about and the number of human viruses and animal viruses have them, it has a lipid uh, envelope or a fatty envelope surrounding that nucleic acid and protein coat as well. And within that fatty envelope are proteins that the virus uses to recognize 
cells that it can infect and to enter into the cell. Now, viruses are extremely small. Their size is, ranges between 20 to 200 nanometers. And that probably doesn't mean a great deal to most people because it's a, it's a size that we can't even fathom. It's really, really small. We compare a virus, which is approximately this size here, to a human cell, that's the difference. And if we compare it, a virus, to a bacterial cell, that's, that's approximately the difference. But to, to non-biologists, that too doesn't really make, oh, it's, it's, it too doesn't really explain or provide a good understanding of what the size differences are. So I think a good analogy that I'd like to make is if we take an ant, we, we can all envisage an ant, it's about half a centimetre, five millimetres long. And if we then compare a virus to that, if we now say, okay, our virus is one millimetre. We can, we can understand what one millimetre is. Um, and then we say, okay, if, if, an ant, if our virus is, is one millimetre long, then our ant, which we know in reality to be five millimetres, in comparison to a virus of one millimetre is 50 metres long. So that's the size difference that we're talking about. And when, we're, and when at least in, in, in this country, in Israel, we talk about uh, an, an unseen enemy, that's why it's unseen. It's really at such a low level, low si a small size that we really can't fathom it. Okay, so how do viruses replicate? So as, as I mentioned before, they're obligatory parasites. They cannot replicate outside of a living cell. Okay, and these viruses, they exploit the cell, utilize the systems, the replication systems, the protein production systems and other systems inside cells to replicate themselves. And then they generally kill the cells at the end of that process when they leave the cell. So if we have a look at, um, this is a culture from my particular lab where we've got a, a cyanobacteria, a particular type of bacteria that we work on. And we grow them inside a plate and they cause the plate to appear green, but then a virus comes in and starts an infection in one particular place and kills the cell. And, uh, and it releases hundreds of viruses per cell that, that was infected. And then those viruses go into cells next, to, next, next door to those cells, infects them, and then releases hundreds of cells. Each cell uh, uh, um, releases hundreds of cells, and then this just increases, increases. So you start with something that you can't see at all, to something that comes this size, to with time increases to these sizes of what we call plaques or regions where they've killed off the cells. So viruses don't really grow like cells. Um, the, the way they replicate is that they produce, they synthesize the genetic material, they synthesize the proteins, and then they assemble those into the virus particle. And so they don't grow like a bacterial cell or like our cells, which grow and then divide, grow and then divide. They Rather, they synthesize the materials, put them together, and then burst out of the cell, killing the cell as they do so, and, and causing this sort of havoc to the cells around. Okay, so the particular a virus that we're talking about is called a coronavirus and it's called that because of the way they look. They appear crown-like or like a halo and that's where the word comes from in, in Latin, a, a corona. The type of genome that it, ha it has, the type of genetic material it has is different to those of cells. Cells have DNA, this particular virus has RNA, um, which, is, which is a little different and it's not really that relevant for the discussion, but if we want to discuss it at the end, we, we can. Its size is fairly large for an RNA virus, approximately 30,000 30, nucleotides or, 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 or small building blocks that make up the genome. It's, as I mentioned, it's got a lipid or fatty envelope. And what we see here is um, that the genome interacts with protein and then we have a fatty, a, a fatty envelope around it. Its, size, its shape is generally uh, spherical, and it's got approximately 100 nanometers in diameter. Um, and if there's any, anybody's interested in uh, some scientific literature, where well, there are some reviews here that you can, you can read up about it, about the family at least. Okay, so what, um, what do we know about the coronavirus family? 
uh, and, and, and their interaction with humans. So there are seven known uh, human coronaviruses. The first four that I've listed here are viruses that we've probably been living with for many years and they cause the common cold. Upper respiratory, mild symptoms. And um, uh, estimates suggest that anything between 10 to 20 to 25 percent of the common colds that happen in the human population are caused by one of these coronaviruses. There are other viruses from different families that also cause the common cold. Oops. Okay, and then we have three viruses from this family that cause much more harsher um, conditions. Uh, lower respiratory, lead to pneumonia, and cause death at um, considerably high uh, rates. So the SARS, Covirus 1 uh, was just called SARS covirus at that, at that point in time. Uh, first moved from animals into humans in 2002. And then there was MERS, which stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, that came out in Saudi Arabia in 2012. And now SARS covirus 2, uh, which, which also came from. Um, came from China. So both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 originated in China. Okay, if we have a look at the genome of these viruses, I'm not really going to go into this except just to say that it's split into two parts. One part of it uh, encodes proteins that are required to replicate its genome, and then there are other parts that uh, encode structural um, that, that are responsible for producing the proteins that um, make up the structure of the, of the virus, including the protein that makes the coat around the genetic material and also the proteins that are in, embedded in the um, lipid or fatty envelope and are required by the virus to recognize its host self. <clears throat> okay, so one thing I do wanna mention um, for mainly for the discussion later on, is that within the replication region, the number of proteins that it uses. And one of the proteins that it has, and is a little unusual for RNA viruses, and it's found in this particular family of viruses, and we hope it's also found in the, in the particular virus that we're talking about. This particular enzyme has the ability to proofread replication when the virus replicates. And, and why am I saying that we hope that this is the case, it means that there's less errors during the replication process, less mutations, so that there's more conservation of the virus over time. So this should help us find, when we find a vaccine, this should mean that the vaccine will be good year after year, different to what happens with flu, where there is no way, there is no means for that virus to correct its replication process. So there's many errors and it, and it, and it evolves very rapidly and we have to make new vaccines year after year. Okay, so if we have a look at where, what's the source of this virus, and, and, and this is important because there's been a lot of discussion um, on the news and people saying that this is a conspiracy, that this was made by humans. So is this the case or did this come from an animal source? So the way that this is looked at is we, look, we take um, not me, but the people who did the work, uh, scientists take um, samples from people who were sick and they isolate viruses or they sequence um, uh, the viral genome from those sick people and then they compare the sequence to the sequences of other viruses from that family that are known. So if this was a um, engineered virus from one of the known human viruses, then we would expect it to be very, very similar to those human viruses with just minor changes that might have been introduced to it to, to cause it to infect us very well. So if we have a look now at the sequence identity to the sars cov virus one then we see that this current virus has approximately 80% identity across its genome, which is which is not low, but it's nowhere near as high as what was found 
to, uh, to a bat virus, 96% identity to a bat virus. And we can see this graphically. Here we've got the position along the genome of, of the virus genome and, and the y-axis, the percent identity of the building blocks that make up the genetic material. And what we have here, 100% is basically the virus that we're looking at. And then we compare that virus genome to the genomes of other viruses across, across the length of the genome. And what we see is that the bat, the, the bat virus that it's most closely similar to is, is, is similar across the genome. Um, there are certain regions that there's a little bit less identity to it, but it's pretty much across the genome. If we have a look at the SARS virus that infected us in 2002, humans in 2002, that's here in red. And you can see that there are regions of fairly high identity, but then there are other regions where the identity is not nearly as high. And what we have in, in pink and in green are other bat viruses that the SARS virus, virus is thought to have come from. So clearly it's not as, it, it's more similar to a bat virus than to a previous human virus. We now have a look at that in a different fashion in what's called a phylogenetic tree, which can give us information on the ancestry of the virus. What, where did it come from? Most likely based on um, its sequence. So this is, this is in red here, these are the sequences of the genomes that came from the first human uh, um, infected people. And they all cluster together and they're all very similar with over 99% identity across them. And the bat virus that's got 96% identity across its genome clusters together with it, showing that it's likely to be the most common uh, uh, um, ancestor to, to the virus that went into humans. And it's very different to the SARS virus that infected humans and this SARS virus is more similar to other bat viruses. And it's also very different to the MERS virus that I spoke about that came out in 2012. Um, and so it also is not the source of this virus. So it looks like bats are the source. Now I have to say that the data on this is changing uh, um, from time to time more information is coming forward and somebody forwarded me a, a paper just this morning suggesting that while this virus has originated from bats, there might have been some swapping of parts of the genome in, pen, in pangolins. Um, so it's possible that the source, it looks like the source is bats, but also some parts of the viruses might have come from pangolins. And uh, it, it looks to be a, a combined virus that's coming to humans, but mainly uh, of bat origin. Okay, if we have a look at the infection cycle of a typical coronavirus, we don't know too much about this particular virus, but of a particular typ typical coronavirus, uh, it first uses one of the proteins that are stuck inside its fatty membrane to recognize a protein on the surface of our cells. Now this protein isn't on the surface of our cells to help the virus get inside of us. This protein is on the surface of the cells and has a, 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 um, a purpose that's necessary for us. And it's involved in, 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 in ensuring um, a necessary function within human cells. And the virus makes uh, utilizes, uh, exploits the presence of this protein to recognize it, attach to it, and enter into the cell through those, uh, those proteins. It then, once it gets inside the cell, um, it fuses its membrane, its fatty membrane, with another membrane of a compartment inside the cell, and then it releases its genome to the, to the cell cytoplasm. It doesn't matter uh, if, you know, if you don't know the terms, it's not relevant. It just it releases it into the cell and then it, replic it, it produces the proteins needed to replicate its genome. It replicates its genome and then it also makes 
the RNA necessary to translate more proteins that, are, that make up the particle itself and that encompass the genome inside of it. And then this gets assembled and gets carried towards the end of the, the edge of the cell and is released from the cell. And this cell will die when this has happened sufficient number of times that the cell can't handle it anymore. It's been, all of its material has been sucked up and used for the, for the virus. And then also it's released from the, from the cell and it kills the cell. And then once it's released from the cell, it's available now to go and find new cells that are still living and to uh, attach to, the, to the, these proteins on the cell surface and to repeat the cycle time and time again. Okay, so the whole business of uh, recognizing a receptor on the cell surface, attaching to it and entering to it, are what determines the host range, what we call the host range of a virus, who it can infect. And I'm not talking about who as in you or me, I'm talking about humans, bats, camels, pangolins, cats, whatever. Um, so this is the key to the virus being able to recognize humans. So if we have a look at the protein or the gene that encodes that spike protein that's here within the fatty envelope, we see and we compare that gene to the SARS virus that infected humans in 2002, we see two major differences. We see one region that's responsible for the connection with the protein on the cell surface and we see six differences or five five to six differences with the first SARS virus and um, biochemical work that's been done shows that this version of the spike protein attaches more strongly to the protein in our bodies than that of the SARS virus and can be one of the reasons that it infects us more, more easily or, or better. And there's another change relative to the SARS virus that um, introduced 12 nucleotides that enables, I'm not gonna go into the biology of it because it, it, it's, it's, um, it's less relevant, but it enables it to get into the cell better and to, be, to release its genome into the cell more rapidly. And so when that happens, basically the virus can attach and get into the cell more easily and the implications of this are that perhaps less of virus are needed to initiate an infection in a human um, person. Okay, so this is relevant to its transmission and its ability to spread from person to person. So what does transmission depend on? It depends on, first of all, how many particles are released from the person prior. Um, it depends on how well this virus survives in the environment. It depends on how many infective viruses reach a new host, how well, how effective that the, these viruses are in recognizing and attaching the new host, which is what I just discussed prior. And of course, it also depends on the effectivity of, of our defenses. And we've got a number of different layers of defense against all sorts of, of, of pathogens. Uh, viruses and bacteria and other pathogens assault our bodies on a regular basis, but we have a very um, intricate uh, mechanism of defense and a number of different layers of defense. For example, uh, against viruses and pathogens in general, we have skin, which keeps a lot of viruses away from us. From respiratory diseases like this one, we have mucus linings in our, our respiratory system that catches them and prevents them from re reaching cells that they can infect. And then when that, once, if enough viruses do uh, reach cells that they can infect, each cell has its own mechanism of defense and that can fight off the viruses. If, however, there are enough viruses reach the cells and they replicate in those cells without those cellular defenses, 
being able to ward it off, then um, the, the sorts of uh, um, mechanisms of defense I'm talking about are programmed cell death, for example. If enough cells are infected and cause that to happen and don't manage to ward off the, off the infection, then our immune system kicks in, both the innate and adaptive immune system. And then we develop antibodies and fight off the disease that way. Um, but that takes seven to 10 days to kick in, to kick in and it depends on, on how, how good our, uh, our immune system responds. So it's both the effectivity of the host defense, but it's also the number of viruses that, that hit our bodies as to whether an infection will eventuate and what the outcome of that infection will be. Now these viruses, they're respiratory viruses that infect our respiratory system. So they spread through aerosol, dispersal, droplets of water in the air that leave us um, and they need to remain hydrated. If they dry out in the air, they are inactivated in general. Now we don't know exactly about that, this particular virus, but, but in general, that's what's known about this family and, and other respiratory viruses. Okay, so let's have a look now at how exactly this is, is spread or how mainly this is spread. So it comes from our respiratory system. So when we sneeze, when we cough, when we speak, when we lecture, when we sing, then we have droplets that leave our bodies and go into the environment. Now these, the larger the droplet, the more viruses that are likely to be in that. But that also depends on how rapid they're replicating in our system as well. But these droplets, these large droplets are heavy and they drop out of the air within one to two meters from our body. So this is the reason behind the uh, directive to stay two meters away from people. So that if they spit, when they speak, or sneeze or cough, the chances of those droplets hitting us are low and that they will fall to the ground before they'll hit us, okay? The other thing is if people, when people speak, for instance, I've been lecturing to you now and droplets have been going onto my keyboard. Keyboards are terrible places for getting, for picking up stuff. Um, then they drop on surfaces and then if somebody comes along and touches the same surface and then touches their face, which is the intake for these viruses as well, then the virus has been transferred, okay? And then how many of those viruses reach the next, per reach the cells that it can infect will determine on whether an infection actually uh, results. And this um, really leads to to two things. One is use of masks if somebody's sick and they're leaving their house so that they don't spread it. Less so for people who are healthy because first of all, there's no evidence to suggest at this point in time that it stops it on the intake, partly because masks aren't so comfortable and we're not used to using them and we touch our faces a lot with them because they annoy us. So we might actually be doing the opposite. And the need to wash your hands when you, when, when you, after you sneeze, after you cough, to use your elbow, and also after you've been outside. So in the, in the weeks before we were uh, in, 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 in our homes and we could still go to work, but this was going on and nobody knows if they're infected, then I was washing my hands as I left my house, before I went into my car, I reached my place of work, I would wash my hands. And then in my, if I was hanging around in my office all day, that was fine. But if I sneezed and I was meeting with people, then I would also wash my hands or use alcohol gel. If I went elsewhere in my office, in, in, in my lab or something and, and met with people then and I touched stuff, then I would wash my hands. And before I would leave work, I would wash my hands so that I wouldn't bring anything that I brought from work back home. So what I had at home not to bring to work, what I had at work not to bring home, etc. Okay, so we've heard a fair amount, at least in Israel, about uh, the survivability or the stability of this, of this virus um, in the environment because it's relevant for how it spreads. And we've heard things like it can last for three days on stainless steel, it can last for two days on plastic and more than three hours in the air and 
at least a day on cardboard and all sorts of stuff like that. And it's true, it's true, but it's not the whole story. If we have a look at the top layer of graphs here, what we're looking at is the, the number of infective viruses over time on these different sur surfaces, here in aerosols in the air, and here on different surfaces, copper, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic. We have time on the x-axis, and we have the number of infective viruses on the y-axis. And this is a log scale. So every, every line here is a tenfold decrease in the number of infective viruses. So if we have a look, let's say on plastic, we have a number of, in, of infective viruses at time zero and immediately when they were released or landed on that surface. And then within uh, 24 hours, we have a nearly twofold, ten, sorry, nearly a hundredfold less viruses that are still viable on that surface. So it's true in 24 hours, if you start, touch a surface, there will be still viruses, but there'll be way fewer. And that's relevant for how, how uh, rapidly or how likely you are to be infected after having touched them. So, um, but on the other hand, if you come along and touch in a region that's been uh, just deposited viruses in a droplet, then, then, you're, then you're going to be picking up a lot of viruses. Okay, so yes, they touch surfaces and it depends on, on how long afterwards that you touch it, how likely you are to uh, pick it up. But once again, if you wash your hands with soap after having touched that, before you touch your face, you'll be fine. Okay, there's been a fair amount of discussion about seasonality. And this has come from the fact that the flu uh, is known to be seasonal or other respiratory viruses are known to be seasonal. And you see that uh, this is for the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, you see that the, um, there's more infections in the summer than there is in the winter, in the summer than in the winter throughout the years. And um, there's a number of hypotheses of why this is, but one of the ones that uh, I think is scientific, fairly scientifically based is the survivability of particles, virus particles, in aerosols at, at different temperatures and humidity levels. So in winter, we have low temperatures and low humidity. And at that stage, we have very high transmission and stability of virus particles in aerosols. If we look at five degrees and we, in, we go on the, y, on the x axis, sorry, there's relative humidity on the, on the x, on the y axis, we have transmission, percent transmission, and we have two different lines of temperature at five degrees. And an increase in humidity, we get a decrease in the uh, transmission of, of, the, of the virus because the particles drop out, at, um, sorry, the droplets drop out of the air and the, and the, um, uh, the virus leaves uh, the, um, the droplets in the, uh, and the viruses in them leave the air. We have a look at 20 degrees. Once again, at low humidity, there's a lot of transmissibility. With an, increase in with an increase in humidity, the virus particles become unstable. Um, virus uh, particles at a higher, an intermediate level of, st of, of humidity, virus uh, particles are stable again, and droplet, nuclei droplets form less than five microns. Don't know exactly what, what size droplets we're talking about here. But then once again, when humidity increases to about 80%, once again, the droplets drop out and um, there's no transmission. Now, there are other hypotheses, but based on whether mucosal surfaces inside our bodies change in the season, whether the ability of our immune system to handle disease changes um, in, the, in different seasons. But I don't know how good the science is behind that. What I do know is that in Australia, it's, it's summer now, right? And, um, uh, and the disease is happening. So even if there is a seasonal component to it, then um, it might reduce when we go into summer, but I don't think it's gonna go down to zero. Um, and even if it does drop during the summer, there's likely to be a resurgence again 
in the winter. What it might mean for Australia is that uh, maybe the worst hasn't happened yet as far as transmissibility, if their transmissibility is less in the summer than in the winter. But we don't know about this particular virus and I, and I don't think we will know until more uh, research is done. And I, I should say, I, I didn't mention this yet, but three months is no time, is so little time for people to do research on this virus, even though people are, uh, scientists are doing massive amount of research and this research is being published at a rapid rate to get the information out there so that people can use the information and do more research about the biology of the virus, it, it, it takes time to get uh, understanding of what, what's happening with this particular virus. But I should say that because this virus is similar to other viruses, a lot of our assumptions are based on what's known for the family in general, and that helps us um, give, um, uh, get some sort of understanding of what we might expect. Okay, so now I want to uh, turn to the epidemiology of this disease and there's two major uh, factors, numbers that are relevant for us. Um, one is the transmission number or it's also called the, rec uh, the reproduction number, R0, which you might have heard about. And this value talks about the average number of people a sick person will infect. So if we take 100 people and we look at how many people each of those 100 people are likely to infect and then we average that out, that's the R0 number. When we talk about a susceptible population, a population that doesn't have immunity, either our own natural immunity or a vaccine. And the number that's very relevant for whether this is going to spread and cause or potentially cause an epidemic is um, is one. If we have a transmission number of one, then this, it's going to remain fairly steady. Each person that is infected is going to infect one other person and it's not going to spread. If we have uh, an, a one, uh, sorry, a um, transmission number of over one, then this uh, disease will spread and has a, a a good chance of causing an epidemic. If it's less than one, then it won't spread and the instances of it will decline. The estimates for SARS covirus 2, this particular virus, range. They range from about two to about four, um, which all of the estimates are well above one. If we want to compare to, to influenza, the Transmission number of influenza is 1.3, and we know that influenza spreads really, really well. So this is way more than the spreading level of influenza, even for the lowest estimate of two. The estimate that I think is most accurate, at least in the beginning, when nothing was done to try to mitigate the transmission, is about three, 2.9. This was done... Um, from by, by a, a researcher or researchers in Imperial College in the UK, where they took the values of people that went on planes from Wuhan to Germany and perhaps other places in Europe. I'm, I'm not sure if it was just Germany or other places. And where those countries monitored, they tested all the people that were on that plane and followed them over time to see what the outcome of these people were. And it wasn't, they weren't doing it for scientific reasons. They were doing it to know so they could collect those people and say, you need to be in isolation. And when, you, when, when they did that, the, the um, transmission number that they come up with is, is 2.9. There's some assumptions involved in that. So it's not a, it's, it's an estimate. It's not an accurate number. And that's something that I want to bring up now is that during an epidemic or during a pandemic, what we've got now, this number changes all the time as new information comes out. It's a moving target. It's not because the science doesn't know what it's doing. It's because the information is changing all the time and we don't know this virus. And the numbers, the actual transmission number, the real transmission number will only come out at the end of uh, an event. 
and and so it can be done uh, for for China now because they've managed to to um, reduce it. Um, and also things can be done to change this transmission number by doing the social distancing, et cetera, that's been going on. And then that transmission number will change over time. The other value that we look at with epidemiology is case fatality rate. This is how many people die of the disease out of the number of people that have been verified as being infected by the virus. This is different to the number of people or to the fatality rate of infections. To know the fatality rate of infections, we need to know how many people were infected. And we don't know that because we're not um, testing the entire population. Um, in Israel, at least, we're starting to test more than people that we think are infected, so we can get some sort of estimate on that. But this value, the fatality rate of infections, is only accurate once you know the incidences that exist in the population. So what generally is used is the case fatality rate, the proportion of people that are infected out of those that we know that had the disease. Okay, so this too is a number that changes all the time. And it, um, depending on, on, on what's going on, on, on things that change and there's a but there's a number of, of reasons for that the first reason is that um, it changes in country okay so let's 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 talk about it first of all the overall estimate globally right now is about three and a half to four percent we take all of the cases in the country and all the in, in the world and the number of, of people that have died from that throughout but there's a very big difference from country to country and it changed from about 0.3%, which is what's happening in Australia and in Israel right now. And it goes up to 8%, which is make, actually might even be 10% now in Italy. And this is for a number of different reasons and also 0.5% in Germany. And I wanna mention Germany for, for, for the reason that they have many, many infected people, but they still have a low point, uh, a low, um, case fatality rate of about 0.5 percent so there's two reasons for this differences with country one is it depends on how many cases are reported and that depends on how many people are being tested that's number one it also depends on the care um, if the care is good and the system the health system hasn't been overwhelmed by the number of cases then the num the case the number of cases that have ended in death are low if like in italy the health system is overwhelmed then the numbers are high because they can't provide respirators enough respirators for enough people and it also means that severe that that the um the intermediate cases turn into severe cases um and can't be handled and controlled at an earlier stage now there's another reason why these numbers, even the, net, the numbers that the, that the press report on a regular basis are not accurate for what's going to happen overall. And that's because there's a delay, there's a lag in the, in the time when infection happens and when deaths happen. And it's about a two week lag, something like that. So we, when we take numbers, of death today and compare them to numbers of cases today we get a low value a lower value than what will be at the end what we really should be doing is comparing these values to a period prior to this and what exactly that period is is, is something that epidemiologists work on but it's likely to be something from five to 14 days beforehand and then that would give you the real the real number and we'll know that the real number at the end of the, uh, at the end of this event for China, it's about four um, percent. But China was the first case, and there's chances that other countries will be less if we manage to keep it under control. Okay, but those are the reasons. So we have estimates, but those are the reasons why they vary, and those are the reasons why they're still not accurate, and they won't be accurate until we're at the other side of this. Okay. So now uh, let's look at the timeline of, of infections. Um, 
So from the time we're infected to when symptoms um, appear, takes about five days. So it means that people can be sick for five days, or not, sorry, not sick, people can be infected for five days before they are sick and before they know they are infected. Uh, but because the virus is still replicating in their bodies, they can transmit this virus to other people prior to, the, to them need, even knowing that they have any symptoms. Then it generally takes another two days to go from the symptoms to diagnosis. By the time you speak to the, the Red Cross or Magen David Adom in, in Israel and get uh, somebody to come and take your test for the test, tests to be done and for you to be notified can take up to another, another two days. These are actually numbers that have come from China. Uh, and this, you can see the, if you wanna hear something about epidemiology, from Chi Hong Ling from the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, uh, she's got a YouTube uh, of a seminar that she gave at the Broad Institute, uh, and it's very um, uh, enlightening, uh, but scientific. Okay, so um, this means that the disease can be spread uh, for a period of time prior to people being put in isolation, and is the reason that we have all been put in isolation um, for this period of time so to try and uh, prevent the, the spread of it uh, before people know that they actually uh, are sick. And also because it appears that there are a number of people who have uh, contracted the virus and don't show symptoms at all. So this is highly dangerous to people with pre-existing conditions particularly people with respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and cancer. If we look at an age level, there is an increase of the chance of death with age, and that might be directly linked to the fact that older people have more pre-existing conditions. But I should point out that it's not only people with pre-existing conditions who are in danger. First of all, I'd like to point out that everybody is infected. Everybody can be infected, but the extent of the disease, the, the severity of the disease is different with different age groups. And that's likely to be um, due to um, our, the ability of our immune system to handle the disease as well. If we look at age, the values are at about 0.2% from 10 to 49, below 10. I don't know if there've been any, any deaths or not, but if there have been, they're very few. Between 10 and 50.2% of infected uh, cases that have been reported result in death. This is two in 2,000 people. This is a high number for Western society. When we go over 50, that number increases, we get to Six, in the 60s, approximately 4%. We get to 70 to 80, we get 8%. eight And over 80, we have 15%. That's massive. Most, once again, most of these people still are uh, those with pre-existing conditions, but not, not only. I've heard different values, 50 to 75% of those with pre-existing um, uh, conditions are those that die from it. Regardless, it's very, very dangerous for people uh, that are older. And this is one of the reasons that people who are older should not be visited by people who are younger, who may not know that they're carrying the disease and might infect the elderly. Okay, now let's compare this to um, what's known for other viruses both influenza, which we know a lot about, and the first SARS virus. So, um, okay, one thing I, I, one thing I forgot to really mention, do I go into it? Oh no, I go into it later, okay, no problem. Um, okay, so let's compare it to um, what we know from other uh, viruses. So the, SARS-2 virus that we have now 
began in 2019, end of 2019, originated in China. The source is probably bats, but I had a period in pangolins, or more likely has there's been a, a, a mixed source of parts of the genome coming from pangolins. We have more than 600,000 people infected as of yesterday. More than 27,000 people have died. We're talking about globally. It has an R naught transmission number in a susceptible population with no intervention, no mitigation of about 2.9, and the estimates range from about two to four. And a case for case uh, fatality rate of three to four percent globally, and ranging from about 0.3 to eight percent. Over 160 countries have been affected so far, and potentially more. When we look at the first SARS virus, it came out in, in November of 2002, hang, hung around for um, less than a year, uh, originated also in China, originated from bats, had a period of evolution in civets, which I actually don't you know, um, know too much about that animal infected over 8,000 people, killed under 800 people. The transmission rate was two to four, approximately. Mortality rate, so this two to four transmission rate is similar to what we have with SARS-2. The mortality rate is 10%, much higher, at least double to three times of the mortality rate with SARS-2. The number of countries affected, under 30. If we look at the influenza, which is a recurring disease year after year, and I'm not talking about epidemic or pandemic level influenza, I'm talking about the seasonal flu. We have a transmission number of 1.3 to 1.5. So SARS-2 is much more transmissible than influenza. We look at the mortality rate, about 0.1% in influenza in SARS-2. 20 to 40 fold higher than that, much, much higher. But now, when I was looking at SRE, yes, uh, uh, oh, sorry, do you want to ask a question? I've got no, a question. No, yes, I've got yes. a question. Sure. So, is the reason that SARS, the first one, um, didn't infect as many people with the same transmission rate is because of the high mortality rate, so it couldn't spread? that killed its host? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no, but I'll get to that just in, in two seconds, and that's exactly where I was going now. So, so, so for me also, when, I, when, when this first happened, I'm thinking, and I'm looking at the values, okay, 2%, uh, or, or sorry, a two, um, 2 to 4 transmission rate. That's similar to what SARS-1 is. We managed to keep that under control. So not to worry, we'll just listen to the World Health Organization. We'll do what they say, and we should be right. And um, that was my thinking for a, quite, a, quite a while, until it started um, going out of control in Italy, I would say. That's what I was thinking. And, and, and so, yeah, your question, Naomi, is exactly, is exactly the question. Why did we manage to keep SARS-1 under control and we're not managing to keep SARS-2 under control? Or why is SARS-2 so much harder to keep under control? And actually, I don't think it's got to do with the, the mortality rate. But it does, maybe indirectly, it's related to do with the mortality rate. It's to do with when the symptoms are and when you can transfer the disease. So in SARS, you had symptoms when you could spread the disease, when you were infective. So if you were sick, you were put in isolation, you couldn't transfer it on anymore. Okay? So prior, so that the, the, the Symptoms happen much more quickly, between two to four days. Prior to the symptoms, you're not infective. You can't transfer it to other people. So you can identify the people who are sick and put them aside. Okay? And the severity of that happening more quickly than SARS-2, which does indirectly mean that the, the death rate is higher, um, is, is connected. So yes, it is connected to a certain extent, but it's more directly connected to, we can see that somebody's sick and before, and put them in isolation and prevent them from infecting other people. Before they have the symptoms of being sick, they're not infective. They're not transmitting it to other people. 
Whereas with SARS-2, we have five days from infection to having symptoms, but probably only two days from infection to being infective and being capable of transmitting it to other people. So we have three to five to seven days where you don't know you're infective, you don't know you're sick, you don't have symptoms and you can transfer it to other people. There also appears to be a, a large pool of asymptomatic people, people who don't have any symptoms and are transmitting it to others. At least that's what it looks like at this point in time. I'm not sure how proven that is yet that people who have no symptoms can transfer it. But we certainly know that people who prior to them having symptoms can uh, um, transmit this disease to other people before they know that they're sick, before they have any symptoms. So that's what's making it so much more difficult to control and is the reason that everywhere in the world we've moved from a stage of trying to mitigate and just put people who we know are infected in isolation to isolating populations in general around the world to try and reduce the transmission. And our aims really are to reduce the transmission to below one where it's not spreading anymore. So this comes to the solutions, what's being done currently. The major aim currently is to reduce transmission to less than one because we don't have medicines and we don't have a vaccine. So we want to reduce the spread of it. And the main thing that's being used is social distancing. Stay away from each other so we don't spit on each other, don't have, don't sneeze on each other and don't transfer it. But we're doing, doing that to everybody, the entire population, because people who are infective don't know it yet. So they can't self-isolate. Okay, so if we have a look at what, from China's outbreak, we can, we can have a look at the effectiveness of the, of the methods that they use and they employ, because that has ended now, or not exactly ended, but it's under control. And this once again is from, from, uh, from that seminar. The initial outbreak in China had an R naught, a transmission number of 3.9. That was when nothing was done at the initial outbreak. When they did social distancing, they managed to bring that R naught or the transmission number down to 1.25. That's massive. They did a fantastic job, but that value is still above one. So it will still spread if nothing else was done. So then they went to the next phase where they introduced centralized quarantine. I don't know if that's being done in Australia or not, but in Israel, uh, some level of centralized quarantine is being done, not a massive level, but certain people who have mild symptoms are being put in hotels and being yes. kept away from the other, from other, um, the rest of the population. What they also did was they took their healthcare workers and separated them from their families because they were hit massively and could then transmit it to a whole lot of other people, including their families. So, so healthcare workers were moved out of their homes and also placed in, in, in hotels or, or in centralized uh, uh, quarantine to prevent them from spreading to other people. What they did in conjunction with, with that was they did massive screening to be able to detect who's infective perhaps before the person knows that they have any that this that they've got the virus and before that they're before they have any symptoms to to prevent it from spreading to the next line um, earlier so and when they introduced all three of those uh things then they managed to bring to bring the transmission number down to 0.3 less than one and to bring the um, pandemic under control in their region. And this is the reason that the world, not only China, but also South Korea, Singapore, this is the reason that the rest of the world is using social distancing to a certain extent, centralized quarantine. Perhaps it's more, perhaps it's not enough what we're doing. Perhaps it's more, it was more necessary in China because of this, the density of the population. Uh, and perhaps we will need to, we don't know at this point in time, but combined with, with screening, um, 
it can be brought under control and that's a very positive thing. When we do this isolation, this social distancing and everybody's in their houses, we don't see the effect immediately because people who were still infecting others prior to um, the lockdown throughout the, the world happened, then um, those people aren't going to show their symptoms for another five to seven days. So for at least five to seven days, we're going to see new cases coming along. And hopefully from seven to 10 days, we should see the curve going from exponential to becoming a little bit more linear and over the, over the top. If I look at the values for Australia and Israel, I'm quietly optimistic that perhaps we're starting to get linear. It's too early to say, I think we need another couple of days to see if that's really happening. But then we want to see it to become linear and then see, see it declining to reach below one, the transmission of below one so that the spread will decline. Even after the spread declines, we will still see more people dying because it takes another seven days for, for it to work out whether the, the people who are infected and have medium to severe um, um, effects, whether they're going to recover or not. So patience is needed to see what the outcome of the social distancing lockdown is as far as the spread of the disease and the outcome of the people who are infected. Okay, so the type of screening that can be done, just two more slides after this one. The type of screening that can be done are two types. One, you might have heard it called RT-PCR. This, this screening is looking for the virus genome in the upper respiratory uh, tract, in our nose, in our throat, and where we're actually screening for the presence of the virus. And this tells us the person has viruses that are actively replicating in them now and they can spread it to the next person. So that's one type of, one type of uh, measure. And we can see that uh, somebody who was quite sick, this is done early on in, the, in, the, in China, and then 10 days later, they no longer have active viruses. You can do also a serological test looking for antibodies, where you use an antigen, something from the virus, that can react with antibodies in our bodies. And then we look for those, we take blood from somebody and we look for a reaction from that blood, indicating that there is antibodies with part of the virus. And then we can see whether there's been a development of antibodies. We have two types of antibodies, the IgM, which react early and then decline over time, and the IgG, which stay in the blood we stay in our body forevermore, and then if we are infected again, then we already have antibodies that can ward off the disease a second time. And it's looking like once you do have immunity, that immunity stays, although I'm not sure that the data is fully conclusive at this point in time, but it is looking that it's like that. But those are the two types of tests. So what can be done if these two tests are combined is that we can look use the antibodies to see, has somebody been infected? Do they now have immunity? Can we release them back into the workforce or to go into hospitals and, and work? And, but we should really, at this stage at least, combine it with the PCR assay to look to see whether they've still got actively replicating viruses in them. And we only want to release them back into the workforce, back into the hospitals once they are negative for the virus, replicating and positive for um, the antibodies. Okay, so what are, what are the um, solutions that are being looked at in the future and why are they difficult and why are they taking so long to, to come about? So first of all, it's finding, um, the first line is looking for effective medicines because those can be brought into place for this potentially, for this, for this existing outbreak. First thing that was looked at was existing antivirals, medicines that have already been approved. If we can, if we can find a, um, a medicine that's already been approved that works against this virus, then we could use it immediately. Initially, there were some cases where I thought, oh, okay, we use this antiviral thing, 
this person got better, that person got better. But clinical trials are, um, have shown that this is not, it's not um, clear cut and it might have been anecdotal and might have been chance because the clinical trials that have been done so, so far are not conclusive. So it doesn't look at this point in time that we know of an, anti, an existing antiviral that works uh, effectively against this virus. The next thing then is new, new medicines that um, can work against this particular virus. And one thing that has been um, already uh, worked on is antibody. Somebody in, in Europe in the Netherlands found an antibody that against uh, the first SARS virus, they went back into their freezers and found an antibody against the first SARS virus that works against the second SARS virus. So, but to use it as a, as a medicine, it means they need to go through clinical trials, make sure it's safe, and then they have to produce the antibodies massively and then give it to people. Now, one of, one, one of the questions that comes up is why is it so difficult to, to develop antivirals? And there are really three main reasons, and it goes back to a bit of the biology of, of viral replication that I discussed in the beginning. So viruses, as I said, use our bodies to replicate. So we can't just go in and attack or, or target a system that the viruses use to replicate because then we're going to cause problems for ourselves because they use systems in our body that are essential for, for our body, for our cells to produce proteins, to replicate themselves, to do essential processes that are for our, for our, for our own for our, our own functioning. So we can't just go in and shut down those systems because we cause problems to ourselves. So we need to find specific virus targets for it to work. And that brings us to the second problem. Different families of viruses do it, do it differently. They infect um, people or, the, or their host, but each family of viruses does it differently. And sometimes within a family, the virus diversity is so high that each virus does it differently. So we need to find an antiviral that works against the particular virus. And the third thing is that these viruses change over time. The question is to what extent they change over time. And um, so that means that sometimes you also need to adapt the medicine um, as these things change over time. We can't use antibiotics because viruses aren't bacteria and they have some fundamental differences to bacteria. But bacteria grow and divide, grow and divide. And as I told you earlier, viruses don't grow and divide. They produce, they synthesize the components and then they assemble them and then they kill the, the, the cell as they leave from them. So the things that we use against antibiotics, which prevents them from dividing or prevents them from making their membranes or prevents them from making proteins, we can't use for viruses because they use our systems and because they grow differently. So the last thing and the, and, and, and the best thing that can happen is that we find a vaccine, but that will take time. The estimates are at least a year. And that's despite the fact that there are vaccines or people think that they've got something that could be a useful vaccine already and in fact clinical trials first stage of clinical trials have already begun in the us i think it's about a week and a half maybe even two weeks ago now um, and that's because it first has to be shown that these these vaccines are safe ha uh, we have to know that the that the cure is better than the disease that that using the cure isn't going to cause more problems than the disease which can happen because it there can be vaccines that are uh, are not safe and that has to be verified first and that takes time and then once then once that's shown it's shown to be safe then they increase the testing and do a, a blind assay to to determine whether it's effective does it provide immunity more to the people that got the vaccine than the people that didn't get the vaccine and only once that is known can we use uh, and, and, and go into high production and produce a vaccine that can then be used for, um, for the, the community at large. Okay, so now I'm going to wrap up. Um, so this is uh, an emerging disease. 
that's jumped from bats most likely and either has had some level of evolution in, in pandolins or has received parts of the genome from the pandolins and those have been recombined with the, with, with the bat virus. That's still not exactly worked out. And that this virus from animals has jumped into a naive human population with no natural immunity and no vaccine to help us fight or prevent it from infecting us. This uh, virus is highly transmissible prior to developing of symptoms and potentially also even without developing symptoms. So you, uh, you can transmit the disease before you even know you're sick. And so it transmits in the population and requires drastic measures like social distancing and lockdown to prevent it from spreading and to bring the transmission number below one. It's most dangerous for people with pre-existing conditions. It's an enveloped virus. It's got a lipid membrane, a fatty membrane, so it's sensitive to many disinfectants and to simple disinfectants like 70% alcohol, like soap and water. It also decays fairly well in the environment and doesn't last for weeks in the environment in an effective form. It's got um, an RNA genome um, and it's fairly large. And that, so it's got a similar type of genome, but different to influenza. But as I mentioned early on, it's got a protein that can repair that can prevent as many mutations, as many mistakes as we get for influenza. And while for influenza we need to make a, a vaccine each year because it keeps on changing, chances are that once we find a vaccine against this particular virus, it will be good for a number of years, if not for this particular virus in general, because it has this protein that prevents it from mutating, from, from making as many mistakes as the influenza virus. Okay, now um, I did a calculation for the population of Israel. What's the population size in Australia? 25. How many million? 25, 25 million? Yes. So that's three times, nearly three times Israel. Israel's nine million people. And this calculation is, from, is for, for Israel. So it's about three times more for Australia. If this disease, if this virus was left unchecked, if we did nothing, no, no social distancing, no lockdown, no nothing, then the estimates from the epidemiologists of what happened with this, this is that it would, based on transmission number and case fatality rates, it would lead to 13,500, uh, between 13,500 up to 110,000 deaths in Israel if we let this disease run its course. And this is based on allowing it to infect 50% or infecting 50% of the population and having a case fortality rate of 0.3 to 4%. Okay, 0.3 being the lowest values and 4% the highest values. What we think now is that if we know the transmission, that the chances are that it's more along the lines of 1%. And then we're talking about 45,000 people dying. If we went to Australia, then we're talking something along the lines of 150,000 people. But this, once again, is if we were to leave it, go unchecked and not do anything. If we do what we're doing, we do the social distancing, the lockdown, then this number should be much, much less. And if we manage to stop it transmitting before we have too many medium cases or severe cases, then the health system can handle it as well and we won't get to stages where um, the health system is inundated with cases, not enough respirators to deal with people, and people dying at much higher level than 4% because there's not enough equipment and personnel to um, be able to uh, handle the number of sick people. So once again, I'm, I'm, I'm quietly optimistic at this point, looking at the numbers over the last few days, we might be starting to get out of the exponential phase into a linear phase. To know if this is real though, we need to wait another few days and see if that isn't just a glitch and it continues to, um, to flatten out. 
um, but, but, I, but I'm hopeful that maybe what we're doing now is, is getting us there. So uh, that's the end of what I wanted to tell you. And so I'll open up for questions. Can dogs get the virus, Debbie? Uh -huh. Okay. Especially. <laughs> what was that? The poodles, especially. The poodles, especially. Okay, so that's yes. so that's a good so that's a good question, right? Um, the 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 protein that this virus recognizes um, exists in in many organisms, in many mammals. It exists in cats. It exists in dogs. And one study that I have read has taken this particular protein from anim from humans from uh, civets, I don't know if they've taken from cats, I can't remember anymore, but it's taken them uh, from pigs and it's taken them from, from other organisms and put them into a particular type of human cell. And they've shown that this virus can recognize it and enter into the human cells and replicate inside them. So we do know that they can potentially enter into the cells of dogs what we don't know is if they can replicate inside the cells of dogs. This morning I got an email from a, a colleague of mine saying that uh, there have been two cases reported of a dog being infected and of a cat being infected. And I wrote back to him and said, have they done testing and are they sure that it's this virus? Have they tested for this particular virus? And his answer was, I don't know. So the, um, the real answer at this point of time is perhaps, but we don't know. So if you want to be sure at this point in time, until we know, I would say practice social distancing with your dog as well. In other words, don't let your dog at this point in time play with other dogs. <laughs>